All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Welcome to our Friday night wealth creation course. Um, we're here live on Facebook. We're on zoom. We're on Instagram now as well. If you guys are just tuning in, if you guys are just tuning in tonight, I want to go over a couple of, um, ground rules. Actually, Facebook is not up and running. Let me get, or Instagram is not up and running. Let me get that going here. There we go. Um, so I want to go over a couple of ground rules as we get started tonight, but really what I want to cover tonight is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. It's habits and behaviors of the top 1%. Okay. Last week we wrapped up on our course and we talked about the triangle of financial behavior and we broke it down into what we think dictates what we feel and what we feel dictates what we do. And that's where all of our results in life come from. And so tonight I want to pick up on that. I want to talk about behaviors and habits of the top 1% of wealth. Now, if you guys are tuning in for the first time and you've never seen this before, my name is Jerry. I'm the owner and founder of Wealth Dynamics. And every Friday night on Facebook, on Instagram, on Zoom, on YouTube, we go live. We do a course on finances. Okay. We talk about um, how to increase our incomes. We talk about how to save. We talk about how to invest. We talk about where to invest. And we've basically been doing these courses free every week for the last three years or so. And um, the big reason is it's information that matters. It's information that matters and it's information that the average person doesn't get, right? Uh, uh, so for me growing up, part of my story is, is money was a big topic of ruin for me. It was not something that um, I was successful at. It was not something my family was successful at. Um, and it was something that caused a lot of struggle and a lot of problems in my life. Okay. If you, if you felt the same way, I want you to know that's, that's where I started. Okay. I'm 28 now. I'm an accredited investor. I have a million dollar business. Um, and I'm doing all these great things with money, but you know, I count back even 10 years ago, I wasn't near that. Okay. I was making maybe 20, $30,000 a year. I had nothing saved. I had no investments. I didn't even know how to invest or where to invest. And so life was very interested for me. And at that point I started deciding I wanted to learn about money. Okay. Now, anyone that's been on this track, you're going to be able to relate with me on this. When you start trying to learn about money, you begin reaching out, you begin getting books, okay, books and courses, and you start listening to radio shows and, you know, modern day podcasts is what we have now too. And it's just information, right? We, we hear all this stuff. And so for me, when I started learning about the information, there were things that were missing that I didn't know were missing until I went to apply them. And the reason I realized they were missing is because it didn't work, right? Like, like I would read, you know, this one guy and he'd say, do X, Y, and Z. And he sounds very certain and very definite. And this is what you're supposed to do because that's what his book says. And so I try it out and I study it and I, I master it. And then when I go to do it, I'm not getting the results that he says I'd get. Okay. Or I study this other person and they've got this really, you know, um, glamorous looking, you know, story and plan and program. And it sounds so great. And it's got all of the exciting points. And it seems like it's got all the stuff that I thought was missing. And then I try his thing out to find out that he didn't give me the whole story. So I didn't get results again. And I kept doing that until I realized why are some people getting results with money when others are not? Okay. And that's the question I want to start with tonight. Try and answer that as we go through this. Why do some people get results with money when others do not? Okay. So a little bit about this course, if you guys are tuning in, um, number one, ask lots of questions. We are going to do something new this week. Um, towards the end, we're going to do live Q and a. Okay. So, um, if you have a question, put it in the comments. And then if at the end of this, and by the way, live Q and a, we can only do this on zoom. So if you're on Facebook, if you're on Instagram, we're not going to be able to do the live thing because we're connected through zoom. So get on zoom and we'll do live Q and a. Um, so if you have a question, drop it in the comments. And at the end of it, if you're still on, you're willing to go live, we'll turn your mic on and you and I can talk, um, in real time and go over your question and your answer. Uh, we did that last week. I had a lot of fun with it. So we're going to do that again this week. So and, and to ask questions, we will answer those. If you're in the comments and you can't go live, just drop those. Um, and also only positive comments in this feed. This is mostly for you guys on Instagram. Uh, so if you're watching this, this is a course about finances and money. Everybody that's on here on a regular basis has a desire to improve their finances. Okay. They're taking time out of their Friday they're investing it because they could be doing other things and they're wanting to learn more about money. So someone that's watching this and isn't investing their time because they weren't going to be doing other things and they're just being negative or disgusting or rude in the comments or bothering people, like none of that. This is for people that want to learn about money. So if you're watching this, please respect that um, and let's move forward. So what I want to talk about tonight, guys, is the top 1% behaviors and habits with money. 
Okay. Behaviors and habits with money. Behaviors are the things that we do as a system of action. It's our operating basis. Okay. If someone behaves a certain way, it means that they're prone to do those types of behaviors, those types of things, those types of actions more so than other things and consistently. Okay. Now, just like anything in life, the more we do something, the more likely we're going to get a result in that area. So if I keep doing the same thing with money over and over and over and over, that's probably the bulk of what's causing the results that I have. Okay. Now last week, again, we talked about the triangle of financial behavior. We said that behavior comes from what we do, right? We just defined that again today. What we do comes from how we feel. Okay. And then what we feel comes from how we think. I want to break this down again as a quick review for those of you that maybe missed it last week or didn't get it. Cause this is really quite critical. What we think in our minds, it, it's actually in our brain, in, in, our, in our brain and in our mind, our brain uses those thoughts to send electrical impulses to activate different glands in our body. This is actually a scientific and biological process. Those glands are, are a part of what's called our endocrine system. You can look the endocrine system up. The endocrine system elicits chemicals and hormones into our bloodstreams in order to cause feelings. Okay. Then those feelings cause us to act their nerve impulses. So all of this is wired. You see what I'm saying? So if I think a certain way about money, that thought is going to create chemicals, hormones that get secreted into my bloodstream by my endocrine system through my glands. Those are going to send impulses for me to feel a certain way, which is then going to cause me to act a certain way and dictate my behavior. At the point I thought it and felt it, it's almost not even up to me anymore. Okay. Klutz has a good point. We do spend money based on emotion. That's, that's, that's a very true point, right? But we also invest based on emotion or we don't invest based on emotion or we give money to Wall Street based on emotion or we, we keep it all in the bank based on emotion. So all of these things we're doing, they're based on our feelings, right? Now, when I first grew up, I, I heard, you know, like, like emotions and money don't mix. Not necessarily a true statement. Emotions are what happen after you think. Right. So there's this idea of be logical with money, not emotional with money. It's impossible to separate the two by thinking I'm going to cause emotions. I cannot separate those things. They're, they're part of me as a being. So really it's not emotions and money don't mix. It's dumb thoughts and money don't mix. Okay. Thoughts that <laughs> I hate to be so blunt. Not really. I love being that blunt, but thoughts that make me feel things that then make me act unintelligently or emotional with money that don't make sense. Like that is what doesn't mix with money. So then really it comes down to what am I thinking? What are my thoughts about money? Because my thoughts about money are what turn into my feelings, which turn into my actions. Okay. Now for me, I initially didn't have thoughts about money. Empty subject. I didn't have thoughts because I, I was, I was, you know, a kid and I didn't have money. My family grew up. We were, we were below poverty on our income. Like all of, all of the negative demographics we were in divorced parents weren't together, uh, homeless, poverty, school lunch kid, ride the bus every day. Like that was me. And so I didn't have thoughts about money until I started seeing problems, right? Again, part of my story, this all happened in the same summer. Car got taken away. We got kicked out of our house. And then we were homeless in, the, in a trailer in the back of somebody's house. This was all probably the age of probably like seven or eight years old, right? So I started going from no thoughts about money to the negative thoughts about money. Oh, and same summer, my parents get divorced. Not a good year for me. Seven years old, I'm like, what the, what the hell just happened? And all I could see was it's connected with money. We lost the house because we didn't have money. We lost the car because we didn't have money. My parents got divorced primarily over money. Okay, We're homeless because we don't have money because we can't live somewhere. So all of this stuff, I start then connecting with money. These are decisions, right? I'm starting to make decisions about money, which then dictate my thoughts. Okay, Decisions are stuff that, that we, we choose as a fixed belief system based on the data that we see around us. So when I'm seven years old, the data that I see around me is my parents are divorcing and I'm losing the house and losing the car and we're living outside uh, and, and, and all this stuff. And I'm starting to look at the data and saying, wow, this, this sucks. This is painful. This is not fun. And the common denominator is money. So then I start making money wrong. I'm like, well, why would I want money? Like what if, like, why, why would I want to go pursue something that, you know, screwed up my childhood and ripped my family apart, right? And so that was me looking at all this data and coming to conclusions, taking those conclusions and then turning them into my decisions and my fixed ideas in order to put my thought on autopilot. I don't need to think about money. I already decided what I think. 
Okay, money's bad. Now here's the problem. I think money's bad. Now I start feeling certain ways about money. Then I start acting certain ways about money. For me, you know, I already felt money was bad. I felt it was negative. I had all these negative emotions with it, which caused me to not earn it, which caused me to spend it when I didn't have it, which caused me to spend even more of it when I did have it, which caused me to not save, which caused me to not be interested in investing because I had nothing to save for. All of this stuff was linked to my thoughts, which were linked to what I observed and saw and, and decided was my true knowledge about money, even though it wasn't based on anything other than my own experience. Okay. I know that's a deep intro, but the reason why I want to hit that tonight is all of us have that. Okay. All of us have that. And we're going to go over top 1% behaviors, but top 1% behaviors and habits are very, very deeply linked to top 1% 1% thoughts about money. Okay. Like top 1% thoughts about money are going to get us to feel top 1% feelings, which are going to make us then behave like a top 1%er, right? So as I go through this, we're going to cover some stuff out of one of my, my very first book. This is called How to Create Wealth. Okay, this is the first book I wrote two years ago, um, maybe three years ago now. Short little booklet, but we're going to go through some content from this book. So this is How to Create Wealth by Jerry Feta. That's me. We are going to be going through some information on chapter nine. If you're a client and you have the book, you can follow along on page 28. If you don't have the book, you can go to my website, go to jerryfetta.com. You can grab a copy. Um, It's free. You cover your shipping, which is like eight bucks, but we'll send it out to you. So this chapter is actually called Where to Invest. Okay. I'm going to show it to you. Where to Invest. That's the title of this chapter. Now, we're not talking initially tonight about investing, are we? We're talking about thoughts and feelings and emotions, right? But when you think invest and when I think invest, what do I think of first? Okay, typically when I, when I think invest, if I'm the average American, I think Wall Street. Okay, I think about my 401k. I think about stocks and bonds. I think about maybe real estate, maybe gold and silver, but I think about these, these services and products that I've been told are smart places to put money, right? So <laughs> Josue might know the answer early. Good job, Josue. Where to invest? So I want to read the very first paragraph of this, and then I want to go into what I mean. So where to invest I believe you are your best asset. Why? Because until you realize that that you will always until you realize that you will always be someone else's best asset. Let me hit that again. Because until you realize that, you will always be someone else's best asset. You will spend 40 hours per week serving the 40 to year life sentence trading away your time for someone else's dream while you live in mediocrity. You weren't created for that and if that's the life you've been trapped in, I believe that's a damn shame. Until you begin investing in yourself, you will be stuck there. But what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. Let me break it down for you. So that's out of my book, How to Create Wealth. You are your best asset. Okay. We've heard of this before. You are your best asset. Invest in yourself. Knowledge is the best investment. But I want to pitch it to you a different way. We've been told you are your best asset because it can't be stolen from you and it can't be taxed and knowledge is forever. That's all true. I want to share with you how I think, and I said it in the book, I'm my best asset because if I'm not, I'm somebody else's. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, for me, that meant Christmas of 2013, Christmas Eve, my mom died on the 28th. I'm at work on the 24th delivering pizza because I couldn't afford to take time off to spend it with my mom. I was somebody else's asset. I was not my own asset. Okay, I didn't control my time. I didn't control what I was doing. I didn't control any of that. Right. So, so that's what I'm saying is for me, it was real fast. Like it was something that was real and deep and guttural. Like that's an important thing for me. I want to control my time. I want to control, and my time is not even real. My time represents my action. I want to control my access, my action. Okay. Uh, Jordan says, what's the book called? It's called how to create wealth. If you go to jerryfeta.com, jerryfeta.com, you can grab a copy of it. Um, so I saw that early on, right? Like I knew my mom was six, six months before. Okay, we come around to Christmas and she's on her deathbed and I, I realize I can't get somebody to cover for me because nobody wants to work on Christmas Eve. Let's face it, I'm delivering pizza. None of my coworkers, even though they're great guys, they don't want to do me a solid and give up their Christmas Eve. I understand that, but I have to go to work now, right? Because I am my, I'm not my own asset. I'm my boss's asset because I can't afford to not work because I can't afford to not t- trade time for money. Okay. That's why you are your own best asset. Because if you don't make yourself your own best asset, you're always going to be somebody else's. It's a state that you control or they control. There's no like, 
you know, I have a job, but I'm still my own best asset. And my boss, you know, makes all the decisions in my life, but I'm still my own best asset. What, <laughs> what I didn't like about having a job is I had to ask my, my boss if I could go to the bathroom. It was one of those jobs. Like if I wanted a bathroom break, I had to ask him for permission. I'm an adult. I don't want to ask somebody else if I'm allowed to go to the bathroom. That's like maybe when I'm kindergarten or, or lower in age, that makes sense. Not as an adult. Right. So I'm seeing all these things connecting all these dots. Right. And so I'm seeing, you know, I want to become my own best asset. What do I do? Well, I need to start learning. And then I said, okay, great. Let me start getting these books and let me start getting these courses. But let me tell you what the first book I ever got was called today matters. It was by John Maxwell. Good book, like awesome book, but I didn't read it. It took me like two years to get through that book. And it wasn't even a long book. It was maybe a hundred, 150 pages. But the reason why it took me so long to get through that book is because it was not an investment. I borrowed it. I did, an investment means I put something into it to then get something out of it. I put nothing into it. Therefore, I didn't have a reason to get anything out of it. Okay. So one of the, the, the thought processes, again, we're talking top 1% habits and behaviors. The doingness of the top 1% is to study, right? Top 1% is study. I can't tell you how much I study. I spend right now uh, more than three hours a day studying, like, like not reading for leisure. Like I have a, like I have four dictionaries and a textbook and I'm studying three to four hours a day right now, every day, seven days a week. I'm studying. That's the action, the behavior. Now, behind that behavior has got to be a feeling that makes me motivated to do it. You might hear this and say, how the hell do you study three hours a day? Why would you do that? That sounds crazy. Because it's an emotion. I felt it. And so then I did it, right? Now, behind, behind the emotion, like we said, there's all of these chemical reactions and, and my endocrine system using the, the hormones and secreting that in, in my bloodstream. That's all true. But preceding that was a thought, okay? Preceding that was a thought. My thought that I decided was I'm going to invest money and time into this course and I'm going to get everything out of it that I can, which was different because the first time I ever got a book, my thought was, I wonder what's in here. I'm going to borrow it. Good thing I didn't have to pay for it. Now I don't have time to read it. Those were all my thoughts. So then I had feelings of like, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't pay for it anyways. I borrowed it. So it's not like I'm losing out if I don't read it. And I'm busy and you know, yada, yada, yada. And I spend an hour reading it. And I'm like, I can't get through this. This is boring. And then I do nothing. Okay. So the, the thinking had to be preceded. Now for me, that thought was rooted in my decisions. My decisions again, were that money was negative and bad and it ruined my life. And I wasn't interested in it, which was funny because at the same time I had started my business purpose of the business was to make money. I didn't confront the fact that I was still having those thoughts while I was trying to succeed in my own business. Okay. So, so we're talking about where do we invest? That's the first one in my book here, invest in books. Okay. Invest in books for the first three to four years of my business. I was afraid to invest in books. Okay. The first book I borrowed, I can't tell you, <laughs> I can't tell you how many Amazon audible memberships I started, got the free trial, listened to four books and returned every single one of them because I knew that was the limit. And then I closed the account down, submitted another email and got another one so I could get more free books. I don't condone that. Don't do that. That's dumb. It's unethical. You're not going to get anything out of it. But I'm telling you, that's what I was doing for several years into my business because I was afraid to spend freaking $15 on a book. Okay. And, 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 and a book's not even a big investment, right? A book like this one, 28, 29 pages, like you get through that in half an hour, right? There's probably, you know, thousands of dollars worth of information in this that you could get out of it based on your decision, based on your thoughts. I'm going to read this book and get stuff out of it. Therefore, I'm going to feel motivated to study it. And then I'm actually going to do that versus I'm not going to read the book. I'm not going to buy the book. I don't want to invest in it. I'm afraid to spend $15. I did get it, you know, I, I scammed my way and got it or I borrowed it or I stole it or whatever, but now I don't have time to read it. Like that's not going to translate into anything. Okay. So the first investment I would say is books, invest in books. Now you have to invest in books that actually have credible authors. There's millions and millions of books in the world. Anyone could read any book about anything. Anyone can write any book about anything. Um, let me give you an example of one. Okay. Who's ever read the millionaire next door. Okay. I did. Okay. I was, I was brand new in the, in the financial world. And I was like the millionaire next door. That sounds like a book that I want to read. Okay. Did you know the millionaire next door, the author at the time he wrote the book was not a millionaire. 
That book was based on surveys that he did. He went around and surveyed millionaires and got their opinions on what they thought that, that people should do with their money and then wrote it up in a book. Okay. And it was, and, and if you read it, he talks about how would they drive a, a Ford truck and they live in your know, regular house and all this other stuff. There's nothing wrong with that if that's the lifestyle. But I want you to realize for me to try and learn this from somebody that's not done it, who's asking for other people's opinions of it. Okay. Who's ever, who's ever watched a movie and you knew exactly what you saw, but for some reason, when you tried to explain it back to your friends, you couldn't do it. Right. Like it wasn't, it wasn't something that you could fully duplicate how the movie was. So when you explained it, it just didn't sound like a good movie anymore. Even you thought that you're like, man, that was a lot better than, than when, you know, when I saw it, than when I tried to explain it. Okay. We have some people that have done that. I've done that. Right. Trying to explain a movie. And I'm like, you just have to watch it. You have to watch it. Okay. Same effect happens. If you try and survey a bunch of millionaires and ask them, what did you do? They're going to explain the movie back to you. And it's not going to be as good as how it actually happened. Right. And, and so with that concept in mind, I'm going to be missing things. Okay. When they say live below your means, yeah, they might do that now, but did they do that on the way? Do they still do that? Okay. Is there a reason why they say that? One of the guys that I love to hate on on this, and I love him because he's such a gangster, but Warren Buffett, who's ever seen Warren Buffett every once in a while, he'll send out a tweet or he'll put out a YouTube video or an article or a little clip on CNBC. And he gives you advice and he'll be like, Hey, do this, this, and this, and this, and this with your money. Warren is, is, is an animal at doing this. Warren does the exact opposite of what he's telling you to do in those articles. Okay. Why? Because Warren's a market maker. Okay. Warren understands thought equals feel equals do. If Warren can control what you think through his Twitter posts and his video on YouTube and the article he writes to get you to think a certain thing, then you're going to feel a certain thing. And then you're going to do what Warren thought you should do. And then it makes more money for Warren because he's a market maker. A market maker means he's so freaking big that his moves can control the stock market. Okay. So, so these people that we're reading and studying with these books invest in books, but I want you to look at the authors and I want you to look at objectively speaking, what did they do? Are they giving you all the facts? Okay. Are they giving you all the facts in the right order? And are they actually telling me like, what, what did they do in sequence? Okay. My new book that I wrote blueprint of freedom, we were big on that. We're like, what did we do in sequence in the right steps? What like, is it, is it there? And is it in order? Right. Or is there stuff missing? Okay. Are there things that are over exaggerated or changed or altered or, or made to be more important than they really are? Like all of this stuff, like, like, here's an example of that. You go to a bank, when you go to a bank and sign up for a bank account, what is the thing you're made to believe is most important? Your interest rate. You're, they're like, oh yeah, you get a, you have 1% interest rate or a 0.60% interest rate. It's better than our competitors. So they emphasize that point. I'm like, okay, great. Well, Objectively speaking, in the world of banking, what I should be the most interested in is what they're going to do with, or with my money after I give it to them. I don't even think to ask that question. I don't even realize by signing the little bank application form, I am literally saying they're allowed to loan my money out to other people and I'm giving it to them on an unsecured basis, which means if they default, I'm freaking screwed. And I do have FDIC insurance, but those guys are broke too and they don't have enough money to cover more than 1% of what's in deposits right now. That should be the emphasized point that never gets brought up, right? So I can say, yeah, the bank has a lot of money. I should learn from them. Yeah, yeah, but what, what are they telling you? And is it actually objectively true? So first best investment is read books on finances and learn about money, but actually study who am I reading, okay? Where is it coming from? Are they telling me the truth? Are they giving me the full story, okay? Because if I can bake a cake, but I don't give you the full recipe, you're not gonna also be able to bake a cake, and if I didn't want you to know the recipe, one of my favorite, um, favorite scenes, it's from a movie called Pumping Iron. Okay. I was a, a bodybuilder for a number of years. And so there's this scene where Arnold Schwarzenegger, we all know Arnold, he's preparing for Mr. Olympia and his buddy, Franco Colombo, Franco's like, you, if you think Arnold's badass, you should see Franco. Like Franco, he was shorter and stuff, but he was just a beast. He could lift cars, like insane stuff. He could blow uh, hot water balloons up with his, with his own mouth and his lungs. So Franco is talking to Arnold and asking him for advice, right? Because Arnold's the guy and he's Mr. Olympia and the champion. And then after Arnold gives him advice, he tells the camera, one of the reasons I win is because Franco comes and asks me for advice and I just give him the wrong advice. He calls it advices. He's like, I just give him the wrong advices, right? But that's like, I saw that in bodybuilding. I was like, that happens in finances too. That's what I mentioned with Warren Buffett. Like 
if I'm depending on someone else for advice, what if they just give me the wrong advice? Okay. They could do it out of mal like ill intent. They're trying to be like, you know, malicious with it. They could do it because they don't even know what they're doing and they're trying to re-explain the movie. So books are important, but that's like, again, vet who you're learning from. Okay. That's my point there. The next thing that you should be investing is taking classes. Okay. Taking classes. Now classes are not entertainment weekends. Okay. I want to really differentiate between the two of these. A class means that there is curriculum. Okay. There's a book or a course or something that I'm studying and I'm sitting and studying it in a group setting and we're learning. Okay. And it's different than school because it's not like we're just getting regurgitated information. Like the point is for me to actually learn. The, a class does not mean that I went to a weekend event where there was laser lights and we walked on fire. That's not a class. That's an entertainment event. Okay. A class does not mean that I got a bunch of celebrities autographs and met magic Johnson. That's not a class that's entertainment. So by taking classes, I'm saying you actually go intensively learn something over a compressed period of time. Okay. The best skills I've picked up, they happened over periods of one, two, three days where I just crammed in study. Okay. So get books, but also invest in classes. Okay. So that's another behavior of the top 1%. If you look at a real top one percenter, they take classes. A lot of them have professional licenses because they're in real estate or they're in insurance or they're in financial services or they're a contractor and they have to go take classes to learn a skill or a trade. Okay. Or, or you look at somebody like Warren Buffett. I think Warren Buffett said he spends like four hours a day studying. Okay. He's taking classes on finances. He's taking classes on markets and economies. Right. So take classes. And that's, that's it for me. It was another gradient. I went from like being unwilling to buy books and I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to buy books. I did buy them from the thrift store. Right. Cause I was still, I was still afraid of spending $10 and I was like, I'm not going to spend $10. I'm going to spend $3. That's a better deal for me. Really. It wasn't, I didn't read any of the $3 books, but I got to a point where I started taking classes. And what I noticed is every time I took a, a real class where I sat down with a course pack and a book and I studied and there was a teacher and a course setting and other students. And the purpose there was for me to learn, not to be entertained. Okay. Not to, not to get autographs. None of that stuff. It was to learn. I would walk out of there and I would, I would improve my finances immediately. I would make five or 10 grand because of something I mastered in that class, or I would be able to change something in my finances or my business because of something I mastered in that class. And it would happen instantly because I learned in a compressed, intense environment. It wasn't over a 60 day period that I read a book. It was, you know, I sat down this weekend. Okay. And I jumped into this class and I freaking pummeled it. Right. So, so that's something I would suggest. Now classes are something that are typically going to be more expensive because you're learning from a professional. Okay. It's not a YouTube entertainer. It's not Ty Lopez. Like you're actually usually going to go find somebody that is, is mastering that topic. They're killing it in that topic in real life. And they're going to devote the time to go through a course setting with you, or, or it's going to be a course written by somebody like that, that might be supervised. And you're going to go through that as well. Okay. So be willing to invest in that. Now, again, this goes back to like, what am I thinking about? Right. When I'm investing, what am I thinking about? This is again, a top 1% thing. I'm thinking about what I'm trying to get. If you think about a real top one percenter that is really trying to build, build wealth, they first invest based on what they want to get. What am I trying to achieve? Okay. Am I trying to achieve if it's an asset? Is it passive income? Is it appreciation? Is it tax benefits? So they first think about their desired outcome. The reason why I bring this up is for me, when I started, let me take a swig of water here. Excuse me. <clears throat> when I started taking courses and growing my business and investing in myself, that wasn't the first thing I thought. I thought, what's this going to cost? Right? That's why I bought the $3 book from the thrift store instead of the $10 book from Amazon. What is this going to cost? I wasn't even remotely thinking about my desired outcome. I was thinking about what is this going to cost? How far is it going to set me back? What if it doesn't work? All of these things. And those are important things, but I wasn't even thinking about, well, why am I going to do it in the first place? Okay. Like, and that one took me a couple of years to really get, I would take these courses and not get anything because I wasn't even thinking about getting anything. I was so concerned about what I was going to have to give up to invest in them. So I would never get anything out of them because I, I didn't have intention on that in the first place. So investing in courses, but investing in courses, and this is the same with the books, understand what am I trying to get out of this first? Before I invest in it, what am I trying to get out of it? Now, then I can think about what if it doesn't work? Sure, I think about that with my investments all the time. If I invest in this real estate deal, <clears throat> what's the downside? Based on that downside, how am I going to try and recover that 
or, or defend against that? And do I still want to do the deal? Okay. I need to be able to answer that same thing with a book or a course. What's the downside if I buy this and, 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 and what could go wrong with it? And, and how can I, how can I take responsibility for the risk involved and defend against that? And if it does go down, is this something I still want to do? Okay. The other thing too, is I have to look at what is it going to cost? That is a, a logical thing, but what does it cost in relation to what am I going to get? You see the difference there? One of them is just the, I can't spend money because spending money is difficult and it makes me broke and I don't know how to get more. And it's a very rigid, unintelligent, to be quite frankly, mindset versus what am I going to get? And then what does it cost to get that? That's the real mindset. If I get a, a book or a course and I'm investing in myself is because I want to get something and then I would weigh out what's the cost benefit. Okay. Like cost me $10 to buy this book. I might make 500 that's a good deal. Worst case scenario, I recover my $10 just by finishing the book and getting some information out of it. I'm willing to make that investment, right? So those are, those are mindsets that I would have with taking courses. Now, the other one is then going to events. Now, I say them in this segment, in this, in this order, is books, courses, then events. Most people never read the books. Most people never do the courses. They just go to the events, okay? And then, and then they just freaking fanboy the entire time. They're just starstruck because they met whoever they met at the event. And that was the entire reason they went is they wanted to meet this person they look up to. I'm not like that. Okay. So when I go to an events, I go there to close business. I go there to network with people that I'm going to follow up with when I come home. I don't care about meeting, you know, Magic Johnson or Grant Cardone or Ty Lopez or, you know, celeb. I don't care about any of that. They're not going to do anything for me in my life. Okay. I could freaking meet the rock. That guy's not going to help me one bit. I'll have a cool story, right? So when I go to events, I go for business, okay? Now, the reason I go for business is because I've been reading books before I went. I've been taking courses before I went, okay? So I was prepared because I had some knowledge and some skills at the time I went to the event that I could then utilize, right? So I go to events, you know, to network and close business. When I say network, it means I want to make contacts that I'm then going to follow up with. You're not going to close a deal at the event. You might right? You're not going to find your business partner at the event. You might, but probably what you're going to do is you're going to go to the event, meet somebody, add them on social media, you have their phone number, text them, set up some time to sit down and go over what you do and build a relationship. And you guys will start, you know, start to become partners or clients or whatever it's going to be, but it's a network that I'm growing. Okay. And then they might be able to introduce me to more stuff. So that's a way of investing in myself is investing to grow who I know right? If I invest to grow who I know and I improve my network, then I have more worth for myself because I have a bigger network to, to work with. It's about the size of my network and how much communication I send out to them. Okay. So that's, that's another area to invest. Now the mindset there, the difference in mindset there, again, think, feel, do is if I go to an event because I feel a certain way. Okay. I'm excited to meet these people, right? I'm excited to, 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 to get this guy's autograph. I'm excited to say I went there. I'm excited to be part of the, the, the euphoria of it. That's what I'm feeling and thinking, right? That's not going to translate into anything in my life financially. But if I go to the event, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go to the event because I think I'm going to meet some people there. I might be able to close business. Again, that's what I'm trying to get. Then what's the downside? Okay, what does it cost? I'm going to weigh all those things out. And if it makes sense, then I'm going to go to the event and I'm going to use that to get the desired outcome. That would be the investment I've made. Every event I've made, I've went to, I've, I've made tons of money. I've added clients, I've added friends, I've added partners. Um, and, and that's why I go to those, right? So that's what I would say on, on the third thing. Now, the fourth one is to buy training, okay? Investing in training. There are certain skill sets, things that um, you'll need to practice every single day, things like sales, okay? I trained very, very intensely on sales for a number of years, right? Um, things like investments, right? These are areas that you're never going to master. You're always going to improve. So it's not like, like, you know, learning how to budget where I, you know, I learned adding and subtracting and I'm good now. Like, I don't need to practice that, but I want you to think about sports. Okay. If you played sports, you played basketball, football, soccer, whatever it was you practiced, even though you understood the concept of the sport, because understanding and ability did not correlate right? Like I could study basketball and be a terrible basketball player. It doesn't mean that I've, I've got skill or talent. So I still have to go practice every single day. <clears throat> if I want to be good at that sport, that would be a form of training. So these are these, these topics where 
I know I'm going to need to be a professional. I know that I'm going to need to be an expert. For me, money is one of those topics. I practice and train on money every single day. Okay, that's why we have our training platform, Wealth Dynamics University. Last week, we had our clients collectively, um, we count training points. They submitted almost 6,000 training points in a week. Those are people that are investing in their future ability, right? So, so training is important. Training can be a number of things. So buy access to quali qualified quali quality and exclusive training on the topics that matter to you. Um, I've personally spent this year well over six figures on, on training myself. Okay. Like drilling stuff over and over and over and over and over. When you, when you think of like uh, uh, training, what I think of is I think of like, like the Navy SEALs and the Marines, they do stuff until it's second nature. And it's not new stuff. It's the same stuff they did on the first day. And they do it over and over and over until they, they don't have to think in order to do it. That's what training bre like breeds in a person. That's what it should yield in you. Now, I want to take a pause here because this is what separates, like we said, people that have money and do well with money versus those that don't, right? This is the separating factor, okay? Somebody that has money has drilled and trained and repeated and gone over the stuff that everyone else thought was boring so many times that it's second nature. Okay. The people that don't have money, they did it once or twice. And they're like, okay, I, I get what that is. And then they stop doing it either, either because they didn't understand it in the first place, or they failed to see the connection to how that, that, how that impacts their abilities. Right. So, so like with this, the topic of training and studying, especially now I see two types of people. Okay. I would say actually three types. There's one type that's just not interested in, in any of it. They're not going to train. They're not going to read. I also see people that read, uh, they go wide, right? They read every single book out there. They take every course out there and they do it once. And they can tell you every line from it and who they met and what it was like and what they remember and their favorite part, but they don't have results. They're not doing well. They read 52 books in a year. And for some reason, like they're just reading that and not getting results, right? So that's one group. Now this group typically has this fixation on new material. I got to get new material. Oh, I've already seen that. I, and they won't watch or listen to something because they've already heard it because they've already read it before because they've already been over it and everything feels like it's reintroducing beginner stuff to them. First, it means they didn't understand it in the first place. Okay. The reason why somebody consistently has to reach for new material is because they got the first thing. Let's say this is the first thing. Didn't understand it tried to use it, decided it didn't work, and then put it in the category of sentiment. Oh, that was just a good thing I read once, okay? And then they're like, well, then let me, let me get the next thing because the first one didn't work, so I got to get the next one. They get the next one. Then they read that, and it's the same thing. They read it once, didn't really understand it, couldn't apply it, it didn't work, so then they reach for the next one. And everything that they see as review is stuff they tried before that didn't work, and that's why they're so against going over it another time. I tried it and it didn't work. So I don't want to look at it again because it was a failure. And I don't want to be reminded of my failures. So no, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to read the book again. If you say that word, you know, more than this many times and I'm tired and bored and I quit. Like that's how that person's mind works. Okay. Because nothing they've ever attempted actually panned out. So they have to keep reaching for new and new and new and new and new. Now, the other type of person, they can go deep on information. They can read the same book. Okay. And I would challenge you instead of 52 books a year, I would pick one book and read it 52 times in a year. And I guarantee you that you will get more out of that than reading 52 different books in a year. Okay. Because the ability to go deep is the ability to master content. I hate to break it to you, but wealth is three things. Earn, save, invest. It's freaking boring. Okay. I'm good at it. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you it's boring. You earn money. It's the same thing over and over and over. Earning money is not this new, exciting, like, oh, there's this opportunity and this opportunity. No, no. Think about the wealthiest people, you know, Jeff Bezos. He does one thing. He ships things to people. That's it. Okay. He ships stuff to people. That's his job. He get re he got really, really good at that job. And he got to the point where it's second nature and he's the wealthiest man in the world because of it. Right. Henry Ford, he did one thing, produce and distribute vehicles. That's it. Okay. Might sound boring. Probably is. I'm sure at some point he's like, yeah, this is not fun anymore. I lost the zest, but that's his business. Right. So if I can't go deep on content and read the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over, then I'm going to have a lot of trouble building wealth because that's what wealth is earning money over and over and over and over and over and over and over on the same things. Because when they work, we don't change them as human beings. We have this bad habit of when something works, we're like, okay, I mastered that. Let me try something new. No, 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 no. When you mastered it, that's when you keep doing it.
You don't change things that work. Saving money, most boring thing in the world, especially if you have a sacred account because it's automated. You don't even have to think about it. It just happens, but you're going to do that over and over and over and over and over. You're going to go deep on that subject. Investing. It sounds like this wonderful, wonderful world of fireworks, but it's not. It's the same deals over and over and over and over and over. All my deals look the same on paper. I'm not out there looking for new deals. I'm, I'm looking for the same deal I did last, last time on a different property or on a different, on a different, uh, a different you know, promissory note or a different mortgage, whatever my investment might be. So this, this fixation on having to get new stuff, having to read new content, not repeating things, getting bored if I go over the same thing too many times, that's a byproduct of not understanding. Okay, so the final thing that I wanna cover in this chapter is Get somebody supervising you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you here. Get somebody supervising you, okay? This is not a coach, by the way. <clears throat> I don't know if you've heard my story on coaches. I don't have a coach. I haven't had one in years. Um, every coach I've ever had, I ended up firing early. Like, and I'm going to share with you why. Okay, a coach is something for sports, right? And so a coach calls the plays and then the team, they run the plays and then the coach, you know, tries to write up another play. And that's because the coach sees like more than the players can see, but this is a game. Okay. So when we have basketball and football, like, yeah, you have coaches, but really when you think about coaches for me, I think about when I was a kid, there was a coach because nobody would know what the hell to do if there wasn't one, I would venture to guess most basketball teams and football teams could probably organize and win without a coach. They're adults. They've been in the game long enough. They probably don't need somebody telling them what they need to do. It's just part of the game and the culture at this point. So when I had a coach in business, my coaching sessions would look like this. We would set goals and I'd tell them why the goals were important. And then we jump on a call every single week and every single week we'd have activities based on those goals. And I would either do those activities or I would not do those activities. If I did them, good job. Let's raise the target and do it again next week. If I didn't do them, let's talk about why. Okay. And then let's go over how you can improve it. And then either I did them or I didn't. And that was the same conversation every single week. I realized if I set a goal and don't do it, I don't need to have a coach to tell me that I should do it. I already know I should do it, which is why I set the goal in the first place. And if I'm not doing it, he's not going to be able to help me because that's my own behavior. For me, that's an ethics issue. Okay. If I don't do something I know I should do, that's an ethics problem. Right? So when it comes to a coach, like if I have somebody that's telling me, you know, why didn't you do this? You should do that. Like, really, I can decide those things for myself. I can study and I can get better at my thing. This is not a game like finances. You don't have 15 people on the field trying to coordinate. You have you and maybe your wife or your husband, right? So you don't need somebody overseeing this, this intricate activity. It's you and money and your, your spouse and money. That's it. Okay. So, so when I'm looking at this from the standpoint of hiring coaches, I don't hire coaches. Okay. I would hire a supervisor. A supervisor is different. A supervisor is somebody that watches how I do something and they make sure I'm doing it correctly. A coach has never done that for me because they're not in my business. They're not in my finances. They can't see what I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So when I hire a supervisor, it's because there's an area that I'm struggling with and I want to get rid of that. I want to be a professional. And so I'm going to say, hey, like, like, let me sit down. We're going to take a course or I'm going to show you what I'm doing. And you're going to watch how I'm doing it while I do it and then correct the out points. <clears throat> so if I'm screwing up on stuff, you're going to write that down and correct me. Or if I'm not getting it, you're going to make me go back and reread it because I wouldn't see it otherwise because I'm doing it wrong. And if I thought it was wrong, I wouldn't be doing it that way. Right? So that's something that I would invest in. If you look at, again, top one percenters, like they don't hire coaches. Okay, if they want to get better at, at day trading, they're going to hire a supervisor, not a coach, somebody that's actually going to instruct them at how to become a better trader. Or if they want to learn real estate, they're going to hire a supervisor, not a coach, because they, they don't need to be told what they should do. Okay, a top one percenter has discipline. They don't need to be told how to do this or why they should do that or why it was the right thing or shamed for not doing their, the, what they said they would do that. Like none of that stuff happens for a top one percenter. Because again, how they think. They think about their outcomes first. If I think about my outcomes first, then why would I not do the thing I said I was going to do? You guys tracking? So that's something I would invest in at this level. Now realize we're all the way through. We covered five things about what we should invest in. We haven't even talked about assets yet. 
we haven't talked about real estate. We haven't talked about gold and silver. We haven't talked about businesses. We haven't talked about Bitcoin. We haven't talked about startups. We haven't talked about venture capitalism because if you're not doing these, you don't need to be doing any of those things. Okay, I know that might come as a shocker, but if I'm not reading books, okay, if I'm not taking courses, if I'm not going to events, if I'm not getting training, if I'm not getting supervised so that I can ex- sell at the things that I want to do with my finances, then I don't need to be running around in live play practicing on my stuff. Like I should not be practicing on my investments, meaning I take money and I've never learned about investing before. And I'm going to go try and invest it. And I've never read books, take court, taking courses or any of that stuff. And I'm going to go as an amateur, try and go in and do this stuff. Okay. I'm not going to practice on that. That like, that's something like if, if I'm doing that, I'm missing the fact that that was something I worked for. Remember the beginning of this trading time for money. Like if I'm not my own best asset, I'm somebody else's. So if I'm somebody else's best asset, I had to work for the money to get from them. And then I do something stupid because I'm uneducated and didn't invest in myself to become skilled and then lose the money. I just wasted all of the time it took me to get the money in the first place. Okay. I personally would be unwilling to do that. I would not be willing to to look at that and say, yeah, I just invested, you know, however many months worth of income and work to get money to do this thing. And then I lost all the money because I wasn't skilled because I wasn't willing to invest in myself to get the skills in the first place. To me, that would be insanity. Okay. So, so these are the things that I would invest in first. And those are things that are dictated by behaviors and habits. Now, the other habits that I want to cover, and these are things like, again, basics, basics that everyone should be doing. Everyone should be going deep on. So the first thing is every week you need to be sitting down and reviewing your finances. Everyone should do that, okay? And, and the reason I stress that is because the more successful you get at finances, the easier it is to not do that, okay? The easier it is to be like, oh yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know how much I made or spent, but I know there's money in the bank, so I'm, I'm not gonna do anything, right? So like investing in yourself means taking the time to actually sit down and review your money. So every week I would pick a recurring time, same time every week, I'm not going to ever interrupt it. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to ever change it. I'm not, I'm always going to pick that time and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to manage my money. Okay. So I'm looking at a couple of things here, right? So I'm going to be looking at while I'm doing this, I'm looking at what is, what are my goals and outcomes first? Okay. Think, feel, do what are my goals and outcomes first? So that I'm thinking about my result, my objective, my target as I'm doing this. Okay. Cause what happens is a lot of people, when they waste, when they sit down and review their money, they're not thinking about their goals. Okay. They're either doing it out of the necessity of some financial process they're going through, like qualifying for a mortgage or trying to get a car or filing their taxes. And really they wouldn't be looking at their money at all if it weren't for that thing. Right. So that's really not like what we're going for. Cause they're not thinking, they're thinking about other stuff. The other time people typically look at their money is when they're scared, Right. When they're scared, they're not thinking about their desired outcome. They're thinking about what was the third thing we mentioned? Everything that could go wrong. How much do things cost? If I'm looking at my money because I'm scared, those are the only two things I'm thinking about. What could go wrong and how much does everything cost? Okay. So I'm telling you, when you do this meeting with yourself, you sit down for 30 minutes, you think about your money first. What am I trying to do? What am I trying to get? What am I trying to achieve? Now, dreams are great, but I want you to think about real things. So if you're like, broken in debt. I don't want you to think about, well, I'm trying to become a billionaire. That's great, but you have a long way to go. One of those things that you're going to have to do before you're a billionaire is get out of debt and stop being broke. (laughs) So let's think about how do we get out of debt and stop being broke first. And then we can think about how to become, you know, solvent and then become a billionaire because I'm not going to just suddenly become a billionaire. My, my behaviors may be broken in debt. So those are things that I would have to look at as that's my goal is I want to get, get this thing handled. I want to get this thing handled. And they're real things that happen right now. Okay. So we're looking at that. The first thing is, what are we looking at? We're looking at goals, wins, targets, all of those items. Okay. So the third thing we're looking at here, because we talked about goals and, and, and wins and all these things, we're looking at our account balances. So once I've looked at my goals and I've looked at what am I trying to achieve, now I'm going to look at what do I have going on? Okay. Cause I've looked at my ideal scene. This is what I'm trying to achieve. What is, what is currently happening? What do I have in the bank right now? What do I have in assets? What do I have in debts? What do I have in cash? What do I have in gold? What do I have in, in, in anything I have? I need to be looking at that. Okay. Now this is one that again, like people tend to not do. And the reason why is again, because if I confront it and I see the problem, then I have to make the decision to handle it or not handle it. 
And a lot of people aren't ready to handle the problem. So they're just not going to look at it. So this then again comes back to thinking. That's what I'm saying. Think about your outcomes first. The outcome is actually to solve the problem. Therefore, I would look at the money because I do want to solve the problem because of, of the fact that I do want to solve the problem. Then I do want to know what it is. So I'm going to look at it. Okay. So I would look at your money at least once a week. I do mine daily. I, I use, you know, my mints.com app. You don't have to do anything fancy. So that's basically like what you're looking at. And then I'm looking after I'm looking at that, I'm looking at my, my income. Okay. So I've looked at what do I have? And then I look at what's coming in, right? What's coming in. Where's my income coming from? If I'm in sales, that's my prospecting numbers, my pipeline. If I'm not in sales and I have a, a W-2 job or, or I'm on salary, I need to figure out what am I making this week? And you know, I need to increase my income somehow. So that might mean I add a side hustle. That might mean one of those, one of those many, many things that I'm going to go for to increase my income, like we've talked about in prior segments, but I need to be looking at that first. Okay. And then the next thing is looking at our expenses. Okay. Now I say expenses as the last thing, because most people start there, right? They start looking at the budget and they start looking at, you know, I have this coming out and this expense is coming up and all this stuff is happening. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm not making enough income and I'm going to start shrinking. Like these are all like the series of things that happen when somebody looks at the budget first. And I used to do it. I used to be a Dave Ramsey financial advisor. And I would tell you live on beans and rice and be gazelle and tens and pay off all your debt and have no fun with your money and budget, budget, budget. I'm here to tell you now, on the back end of that, like actually looking at how this stuff actually pans out in real life, those are things that cause you to contract. So we look at what are our goals? What are our wins? What are our targets first? Then we look at what do we have going on? Then we look at what's our income going to be. Then we look at what are our expenses. Okay. And guess what? If the income is not higher than the expenses, go make more money. It's as simple as that. There's no trick to it. Just go make more money. Right? So these are all things that I would be looking at. And then finally, like I would be looking at, I would be looking at scheduling my next one. Okay. I would be looking at scheduling my next one. So that's the final thing I'm doing here is making sure this thing stays on the calendar. Now, these are like basic fundamentals, basic fundamentals of, I need to be studying. Okay. I need to be training. I need to be improving with money. Money is a topic that we even, we never get taught about in school. Uh, it's taboo. So our friends and family never talk about it. No one seems to really know the answers, Right. But, but it's something that's like right up there with oxygen and dying. Like it's going to happen. There will be money in your life. So for us to go through and, and like know all of these other topics, sports and entertainment and art and all this stuff, that's great. But we're not going to interact with those nearly as much as we're going to interact with, with money. I can be a freaking killer artist, but if I don't understand money, life is still going to be hard. Okay. So, so the point of my discussion tonight is top 1% habits and behaviors, they start with the fundamentals, okay? They start with studying and investing in yourself and, and what you're thinking and feeling in order to do that. And it ends up with, yeah, I have passive income and I'm investing and I'm wealthy, but like it starts there. And, and there can be this misconception of the fact that it starts somewhere else and there's this magic pill and there's this secret and there's this silver bullet and we don't want to hear the same stuff over and over and over. But the secret is, is wealth is boring and it takes a lot of discipline and persistency to get there. And most people don't have what it takes because they quit, because they don't invest in themselves, because they don't study, because they do get bored. Okay. If you can just not get bored and keep doing the right behaviors over and over and over and over and over, that's going to help you get there a lot faster than learning all of the magic stuff out there on every course on the internet. So guys, I want to open this up for questions. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hit Instagram questions first. And uh, again, if you guys are on Zoom, if you're on Zoom, I will answer your questions live so I can unmute your mic and uh, we can go through your question together on Zoom, but we'll hit those last. So if you have a question, think of it, put it in the comments on Zoom and we'll answer those last live. If you're on Instagram, let's see what we got here. Good to see you, John. Good to see everybody. Thanks for joining tonight. Okay. I wish on Instagram there was a way to filter out actual questions here. Uh, so someone is asking what my book is called. So this is, uh, again, called How to Create Wealth. Um, if you go to jerryfetta.com, you can get a copy of it.
Let's see here. Man, I really wish Instagram people had some better questions because they could learn something. Isn't that a concept, learning something? Let's see. Uh, someone says wrong advice. Dave Ramsey is the wrong advice. I would agree. So Dave Ramsey, I think is good if you're in debt and not, not making enough money, like pay off your debt and make more money and budget. Sure. But it doesn't get you very far past that. Um, let's see here. Someone is asking, what is the key to success? Uh, I mean, mine has been ethics. Okay. I have this phrase, do it anyways. Right. And it kind of goes back to why I don't have a coach. All of the things that, that caused me to fail back before I was failing were things that either I knew I shouldn't do, or I knew I should do. And either I knew I should do, and I didn't do it even though I knew, and, or I knew I should do it. And I didn't do it. Right. And it was something where I did it anyways. It was, I knew, I know this is a bad idea. I know it's going to cause me to fail. I'm going to do it anyways. Success is the exact same thing. Okay. Every single thing that it takes to be successful, you're not going to want to do. It's not fun. It's not exciting. It's not glamorous. It's not sexy. Do it anyways. And if, if you can just like grind down and do it anyways, like that's going to help you. And that's been my key is I don't think about um, what I would enjoy doing or what sounds pleasurable or what sounds like it's fun. I think about my goal and, and usually I'm not going to want to do the thing it takes me to get the goal. I didn't want to do this live stream tonight. I was like, man, I don't feel like doing this course tonight. I'm going to do it anyways. Right. So that would be my key to success, but that's a question you can ask everybody and they're going to have a different answer. That's just what I think. Uh, Roland asks, what are your thoughts on any type of reset happening? He, so he's talking about economically, will we reset onto a new, new economic system, a new currency system? Inevitably, yes, we always have every 40 to 60 years that happens. So we will have another one. I don't know when it will happen or if it will be because of COVID or, or because of whatever, but we will have one. Um, All right. I don't see anything on Instagram. Let me go ahead and shut them off. We'll handle Facebook next. Okay, great. So let me see what we have on Facebook. Again, if you guys are on Zoom, go ahead and uh, drop your comments and we'll, we'll answer those live today on Zoom. Uh, let's see here. Charlie, good to see you. Uh, Daniel asks, is my book on Amazon? It's not on Amazon. Um, if you go to jerryfeta.com, you can order it there. We've not done Amazon. Uh, one of the main reasons is Amazon doesn't let me see who bought the book. So I'm big on actually following up with people and making sure they understand the content. And so for them to keep the information private makes me not want to sell it on their platform just because I, I don't want to just sell a book to sell a book. I want to actually help someone with their finances. So it's not on Amazon, but you can get it on my website, jerryfeta.com. Uh, Jose, good to see you. Steve, good to see you. Uh, investing in IPAs. That is, that is not the answer to becoming a top one percenter. Um, I can tell you that for sure. <clears throat> Liam says, where can I take classes for, for finances? Liam, you are a Wealth Dynamics client and you have access to Wealth Dynamics University. That is classes for finances. Log in, use your program. There's hundreds and hundreds of hours of content on there. Um, you, so you, you already have them is my answer. Um, so make sure you use them. Uh, Rocky, good to see you. Rocky says, I want to know what you think about. I want to know what you think about why you were the number one salesperson for Grant Card on that one year. I want... I want to know what you think about, I was just outworking everybody. Um, so for, for those that don't know, I was a, a Cardone licensee for uh, a couple of years. And so when the program first started, I, I finished the year, I think in 2018, I want to say as the number one licensee in the world um, by production. And it really was like, we just outworked everybody. Again, it comes back down to doing it anyways. There's a lot of reasons and excuses and problems and things that can come up. And we just didn't accept any of that. And we just got the job done. Um, Jose, good man. He got, he got Liam on the university. Uh, Marcy says, are you calling me out on reading 52 books this year? I didn't even know you were doing that, Marcy. I did that in 2016 
and I finished the year confused and not knowing what information to apply because I read too much of it. So I would challenge you, Marcy, for 2021, pick one book and I dare you to read it 52 times. Okay, like like a, a business book or a finance book that you can actually get through in, in like a month or less. Read it 52 times and then tell me what happens. You'll be amazed. Uh, Rocky says, we also haven't talked about why you were the number one salesman. Uh, already went over that. Uh, Liam says, my goal is to get my first loan and start building my cash flow in 2021. Awesome. Awesome. Let's do that, Liam. Uh, Liam is as a client. So he's talking about getting enough money in his sacred account to borrow against and then invest that for passive income. Rocky says, your content, content is packed enough that it has no problem keeping attention. Make more content. Awesome. I appreciate that. Vanessa, good to see you. Uh, Jose says, the biggest thing that stuck with me personally from this discussion Master one thing until it's second nature, one kick 10,000 times. That's a good analogy. I think that's a Bruce Lee quote. Um, he, has, he has a quote. He says something like, rather than fear the man that knows 10,000 kicks or practice 10,000 kicks, he says, fear the man that practiced one kick 10,000 times. Um, that's a really good example of kind of what I'm getting across here tonight. Uh, let's see here. Steve says, what the preparation of studying for three hours? I don't quite get the question, Steve. Try, try maybe retyping that. Uh, Gene says, what is your favorite finance book not, not written by you? Um, I would say the, the best book that I ever read is called The Creature from Jekyll Island. And the reason I liked that book so much is because it, it, um, it's a big read, but it opened my mind to what really is happening with money and and I would say 99% of people don't know about it out of the 1% that do, you know, a lot of them don't believe it. And a lot of them, you know, they, they try and turn their head the other way because it's hard and ugly to confront. But if you read that book and actually realize this is actually happening, th this is real, um, it changes a lot of things in how you think and operate and see the world. And that's been a big contributing factor for me. So that's my favorite book. If you want something lighter, that's not written by me, you can read um, Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash. That's another good one. Let's see. Jose says, I love the idea of saving, going over expenses until last. It's almost as if you're coming with a completely different mindset. Exactly. That's kind of the idea. Marcy says, I'll work on that and pick a few. Not a few, Marcy. One. You got to pick one book. You could read my book 52 times. Um, you could then become the official spokesperson uh, for my new book, Blueprint to Financial Freedom. By the way, I know I've showed you how to create wealth. I don't want to confuse anybody. I have two books. I just wrote this one. Blueprint of Financial Freedom. You can order that. Go to jerryfetta.com forward slash B2F. Um, and then we have my old book, How to Create Wealth. You can get that at jerryfetta.com. Okay, Steve says, I meant, how do you prepare for studying for three hours? What do you do before you start studying for three hours? Eat and go to the bathroom is the answer to that, Steve. If you're going to study for three hours, eat before you do it and go to the bathroom and make sure you're hydrated. Okay, that's all I see on Facebook. Let's hit some live questions on Zoom here. Okay. Uh, Kevin has a question. Any financial classes you would suggest to invest in? Kevin, get Wealth Dynamics University. That's uh, our course. It's got, uh, I believe, 250 segments. Um, on finances. So everything you would need to know is there. I think it's like 65 bucks a month. Um, okay. Don has a question. Um, so Don, if you want to go live on your question, if you're still on here, let me know. I'd love to do it. Let me see if Don is still on. Don is still on. So Don, uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute your mic. If you want to go live here. I was just wondering if there's any. All right, Don, difference. can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Don, how, how, how is the volume? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Okay, great. So we have some feedback. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go. 
I'm going to go live on my phone here as well. Um, so Don, your question is the difference between the coach and the supervisor. Is that right? Well, I, I, I've all also heard the term mentor. Is there a difference between a mentor and a coach? So I would say the, the mentor and coach thing are very similar. Um, for me, a mentor, you know, is somebody that might, you know, counsel me or coach me through stuff. Uh, but a coach and a coach is, is usually going to be pretty similar. Okay. Does that answer your question, Don? Yes. Okay, great. Great. So let me see uh, who else has a question here. And as we're waiting, I'm actually going to switch over my, um, audio here. Okay. This is, this is much better. Okay. So we have a question now from who's our next question. Okay. Bartholomew has a question. Jen has a question. Let me hit Jen's first. Jen, I can't see your full question. If you want to put that one in the comments again. And uh, let me go over Bartholomew's next here. So Bartholomew, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, my friend. All right, Bartholomew, can you hear me? I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I can. I can. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Just taking notes and uh, um, just listening, listening and learning. Awesome. Awesome. So what is your question that we can answer tonight? So my question is, um, I recently just got the sacred account and I'm going through the coursework. I haven't made it through all the material yet. So I have a question. What is your recommendation to um, properly get rid of debt? with the sacred account. I know I'm probably going to come to it in a course, but I figure I have you here live. Why not ask? Yeah. So yeah. So that's an excellent question. question. So for, so getting, for getting, getting rid of debt, debt with the sacred account, the, account, um, the first thing, um, thing, the first is, thing is, again, the aspects. thinking aspect. So you got to think about the debt differently. So when, so when I had debt, I was considering, considering like, like I have debt and I got to pay it back. And it's definitely like, I was thinking of myself as effect rather than cause. So in the finance world, when a bank loans out money, the value of that loan is considered an asset to the bank because they're going to get paid on it. Okay, so it's actually an investment. So when you're paying off debt, you're actually buying an asset back from the bank. So that's the first thing I change is a slight paradigm shift there. The second thing that I then do is with the um, sacred account, if you put the sacred account together where you have, um, you know, your smallest balances on your debt, so I know smallest to largest, smallest to largest, You'll be able to borrow against the sacred account cash value, wipe out the balance of that debt, and then be able to then pay yourself back with the payment that used to go towards the debt. So it's kind of like working the debt snowball, but you're going to be able to do that by borrowing from your cash value, wiping out the smallest debt balance, then putting that towards your, um, your old payment towards your sacred account loan repayment, and then going down through and knocking those debts out. And by doing that, you get rid of all of the debt, you free up all the payments, you save all the interest. But all that money that was in your sacred account, it was growing the entire time. So you finish it out with actual like cash in your account that's grown rather than most people when they pay off their debt, they finish it out broke. Wow. So you essentially turned yourself into a debt consolidation company while your um, money is um, growing or compounding annually. So using a debt consolidation company in that process? Well, I'm saying essentially what you did was turn your 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 sacred account into a vehicle that can do something similar to that. Instance, you're taking a loan out out your own, from your own account and then you're applying that to your debt, getting rid of your debt, and then paying back the loan to your sacred account. You got it. Yeah. And you are kind of then acting as your own debt consolidator. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. All right. That's it. Thank you. Hey, hey my Mike, pleasure. Talk, talk to you. Okay, great. Let's see who else we have that's got questions. I think, 
Uh, AJ has one here. What's the approach at conferences to not, sounds like you're trying to make sales, but build relationships. You got a suite of 10 X and you talk about the strategy there. Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, uh, take AJ off mute. Okay, Abraham, I took you off mute. Let's go ahead and, and hit your question here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you okay. Can you hear me? I can, man. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Amazing uh, session tonight, for sure. When you were talking about how to maximize your time at events, I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about that strategy because I think a lot of us may go to the conferences and expect to get as close as possible to the speakers and stand in line for a long time. But I know you were pretty intentional about having a suite, inviting people in and, and having your team really do their work. So I just hoped you could talk about the strategy around how you can kind of build relationships for the future rather than trying to get people signed up that day. Yeah, definitely. So with events, and this is just my own observation, I noticed with events, there's really three or four groups of people. Um, there's people that will go to the events, and I would say these are the lowest tier. They're going because they're bored. They're just looking for something interesting. And so they'll go to events and, and you know, it is interesting. And so they go to them. Um, there's also people that go just because their friends are going. So it's kind of like a tiered thing where they're going to go with the people they know because those people are going. Um, I would say the third group goes to meet celebrities and stars. And the fourth group does what I talked about and what you're referencing, which is building relationships, closing business. So it really starts with what's my intention in the first place of going there. And if it's to meet, you know, a star or just go because my buddies are going or go because I'm bored, really, it's not going to turn out to be much of an event for you. That's where people go and they come back empty handed or they just get an autograph or a picture. So when I go, I, go, I look at, at, you know, I, you know, I, I, I do want to close, close some business while I'm there, there but the reality is, is there's like a 2% chance I'm going to close somebody on anything the first time I've met them. Um, every sales statistic in the world says that. So it's about follow-up and cultivating relationships anyways. Now, some of these people I might not ever do business with, but they're people I want to know. And so for me, when I, when I did the, like you mentioned, the suite, our thought there was we want to build meaningful relationships and, and you know, be able to actually connect with people. That's not going to happen in a stadium with 30,000 people where it's loud and distracting. And so we wanted to have like our own little office per se. And so that was kind of what we did there is we looked at, okay, well, again, what, what are we trying to get? And so we, you know, isolated that down. What's it going to cost? We figured that out, figured out, figured out the investment. And then, you know, what is the worst case scenario? And worst, and worst case, case scenario for me is I end up in one of those first three groups. I went there and had fun, fun and met people and hung out with my friends. That's not, that's not bad. bad. That's, that's, that's a fun, fun experience, experience, but something, something I'm willing to take as a downside and event like that. So that was kind of what I was thinking when I went into, when when I went into what I usually what I would think if I'm going to go to an event. And and it really then does cause you to be intentional with, like you said, the follow up after. If I invest this money to go to this place and meet people. It would be a shame for me to do, to spend all that money and meet them and then I actually cultivate anything on the back end with them. Appreciate that. And, and like the energy that you were able to foster at that particular suite, I think that was the first time we met as well. So thank you for answering that question. Yeah, definitely. That was a lot of fun too. It was. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead to our next question. Let me see if we have anybody else. Kevin had fun at the mansion. Yeah, Kevin was there too. Um, let's see here. I think that's all of our questions. Let me just make sure there's no more on Facebook before we wrap up tonight. Thank you guys for hanging out a little later with us. Um, nice. Marcy and Vanessa just made friends. That's awesome. Uh, Rocky's, Rocky's is invest in extra life insurance policies or more silver and gold. I would do both. Uh, Steve says, what is the best sales platform training you recommend? Um, for actual sales, sales training, Cardo, training, you Cardo was, definitely was definitely hands down, down the best. The best. Um, um, I believe if you understand human uh, communication and thought processes, you don't need really sales training. You can just understand human beings because that's what sales is, is communicating ideas. So, but if you're actually looking for a platform, I thought Card on You was great. Uh, Rocky says gold or Bitcoin? <laughs> Hands down gold. Central banks uh, have 79% of their assets in gold, own no Bitcoin, yet they're trying to sell us Bitcoin. So that should tell you everything you need to know about gold versus Bitcoin. 
Okay, let me just make sure there's no other questions on Zoom. If not, we'll go ahead and sign out here for tonight. Don says, I am thankful you did this anyways tonight. I'm glad I did too. Uh, again, do it anyways, right? Um, Kevin says, how much cash you got? How much cash you got, man? I don't hold much cash. I'm, I'm mostly in hard assets. So I, I just bought another kilo of gold yesterday because um, I don't believe in, in cash. I think cash is a terrible thing to accumulate money in. Uh, Bart says, thank you guys. I think that that's it. So we're going to go ahead and sign out. Everyone, uh, thank you for coming on tonight. If this, this was, was a helpful thing, thing for you to share it, it introduce somebody to it, and we'll see you guys back here next week.